Got ugly. Anyhow, gentlemen. Go high, oh garlic. Garlic is in left. That's right. So talking twins every single day for the most part, I would guess, between now and when the Look twins at the finally win a playoff game. Look at the producer. Look how pissed <laughs> off he is. So actually, you know what? Let's give Declan the floor here. Uh, I so agree. There, there's a couple things we have to get to on today's talking twins. And by the way, you can find bonus lengthy episodes of uh, of talking twins too on Mondays on the Mackie and Judd podcast feed. We're going to be talking twins. Every single day here, uh, and until uh, until they become irrelevant or until they finally lose in the playoffs. But uh, Kyle Garlic is on the roster that came out yesterday, the the final twenty six man roster over Brent Rooker, and so uh, Derek Falvey and Rocco Baldelli sat down with Brent Rooker and said, "Listen, we know that you've torn it up offensively." even in the major leagues last year for a while, but Kyle Garlick, journeyman outfielder who had a great spring training, has made the team over you. Declan Goff, what are your thoughts? Uh, this is incredibly frustrating because this is the bass backwards, for the lack of a better words, way to approach how to handle your top prospects and reward the right players. Kyle Garlick has been around the block. He's 29 years old. Okay, He's a waiver claim. This is just classic twins, old school twins baseball thinking. Brent Rooker, was one of the most prolific college baseball hitters of the last five years. He was a he was a boss at Mississippi State. He's accomplished everything in the minor leagues. And apparently, Rocco Baldelli, the, the disturbance in the kitchen, our guy from Curb Your Enthusiasm, sat down with Brent Rooker and says, well, we're going to keep those conversations private. <laughs> but there are a lot of encouraging things you can say about Brent Rooker. He's a tremendous offensive player. Uh, but, you know, I, I do think his defense... He basically insinuated that his defense is holding him back a little bit. Dude, he's a he's a tree stump with a glove, okay? Yeah. Like, hey, he's a butcher yeah. but, in the outfield. But guess That's what? True. Who are also above-average defenders in center and right field? Byron Buxton and Max Kepler at their respective positions. Byron Buxton being a plus-plus defender, and Max Kepler being at, at the very least an average right fielder and probably slightly above it, right? So you can sacrifice a little bit of of fielding miscues from a guy like Brent Rooker when you have an outfield that's already above average. And as bad as ready, Kyle Garlick's going to be off this team by June 1st, dude. You know, he's just a random waiver claim guy. He's not going to make any impact on this team going forward. Make it Are you verbally, serious? Make it verbally binding tomorrow. Yeah, write it down. Write that down. He's off the roster on June 1st. That's no problem. I'll write it down. Right, I'll, put it in, I'll put it in the notes. Make sure yeah. we get that. Yeah, yeah. I'll, the executive producer will put it in the notes. He's going to be off this roster. It's just, it's incredibly frustrating because there's no minor league season either that really starts until May. So it's a simulated game. So him and Kirloff are just sitting there getting, you know, I'm sure they're still taking their hacks and whatnot, but it doesn't help the development of a guy like Brent Rooker to just sit there while Kyle Garlick, who has a nice spring for no, for, and gets rewarded for it for no <laughs> GD reason. God, dude. Oh, you almost said it. You almost, almost had to bleep it. yourself. I almost said Kirk Cousins and Kyle Garlic just get me <laughs> fired up, dude. All right, so oh. so I disagree. I disagree. And I, so I'll lay out my case here. Maybe Judd, maybe Judd can play judge and jury here. So, so Rooker is a terrible defender in the outfield. So that, that, I think that's where this premise starts. And I'll even go back further. I think when the when the Twins front office looked at in Rocco Baldelli when they looked at that series against the Astros, so we all looked and said, "Can somebody hit a double to the gap and score two runs?" Because like they they just the Twins. We talk about the eighteen game playoff losing streak. The Twins haven't scored more than four runs in a playoff game, also since like two thousand four. So offense in these key situations has been a big problem. So on that level, well, Brent Rooker's got potentially a really good bat, right? But I think the thing that stands out most to the Twins front office and Rocco Baldelli is the defensive miscue in that close game against Houston. In the I think it was the deciding game, too. And Jorge Polanco butchers that play at second base and throws that ball into right field. And I think they looked at that and said, all right, first things first, he's not going to be our shortstop next year. Like, let's, let's, let's get a real shortstop in here, Andrelton Simmons. And then I think they went a step further mentally and said, Let's just be, we've got Donaldson at third, Andrelton Simmons at shortstop, Byron Buxton in center field. Let's go out and be the best defensive team in Major League Baseball. And Brent Rooker does not really fit into that profile because he's just not, like, if you thought Josh Willingham was bad in the outfield, I mean, Brent Rooker, at least in the small sample we've seen him, has been really, really bad. And so I think, 
I think they think Garlic is a better defensive player than Rooker, which seems to be a no-brainer. But I also think they looked at Garlic's ascension through the minor leagues the last few years. Now, he didn't play in the minor leagues last year because there were no minor leagues. But this dude had a 1,000 OPS in AAA in 2019 in the Dodgers organization when he was like 27 years old, which is a higher OPS than Brent Rooker has put up in any year in the minor leagues. And I think they look at that and say, boy, this dude, like, he, he was a 28th-round pick. He's worked his ass off. He's a better defensive player. He was he was lightning hot his last stint in AAA, and he was the hottest player in spring training. How can we not give this guy a look for a couple months while Brent Rooker, uh, while Brent Rooker looks to, I don't know, like, grow faster legs? <laughs> I don't know what the solution is for him in the outfield. But I, I'm just t- telling you, Dex, I see their logic. I also think Brent Rooker is going to be a really good major league hitter. So I, But I see their logic on this. Yeah, I remember when uh, Chris Parmley at 24 years old at AAA had an OPS over 1100 too, and he turned out to be a really, really good player. So I, I just I would rather reward the top prospect who was a, what like the 40th overall pick a couple years ago in the 2017 draft over rewarding a waiver claim guy who was just recycled and been around the block. It could be a Robbie Grossman situation, right, where he actually turns out there's a productive career there, and he can have a nice little cup of coffee. But I think Brent Rooker at the end of the day is going to make a bigger impact than Kyle Garlick will. All right, Judd. All right, break the tie here. The reality is the tiebreaker is one guy, and it ain't Kyle Garlick, and it's not Brent Rooker. It's Alex Kirloff. This is a holding place. What what this tells you is nobody won that job. This is why I wanted Kirloff to hit 260 so that we we could just openly rip the twins, but he didn't, and it makes it tougher. Uh, but, I mean, this is nothing more than a holding pattern. Like, this is a who should play there. And, Phil, defensively, you're probably right. I, I mean, I saw – so Rooker played in seven games before he took the Zach Plezak pitch off his arm and broke his arm at Target Field last year, and he's a butcher out there. He's pro- He probably projects to uh, possibly have, having the opportunity to be Sano's replacement at – first base when Sano strikes out 1,000 times and they finally get sick of that. Because uh, I don't think he, or, or he's going to replace Cruz as DH long-term. I don't think he has a future in a big league outfield consistently. He's just not that guy. But I mean, this all this all comes back to one thing. The placeholder for Kirloff. That's what this job is. He's coming up at some point. I don't, don't know if they're going to try and get him at bats in St. Paul starting on May 4th or if this uh, charade is going to be completed by the fact that he gets zero at bats b- before he comes up. I believe the date that they can call him up without forfeiting the year of service time is April the 16th. But the bottom line is nobody won this job. The Twins just had a really good excuse to say, Kirloff hit one, what, 22 or so. He's going down for now. He will be back very soon. Don't you feel like they almost, like, it just in order to not look fishy and further not to be a grievance, don't they almost have to hold Kirloff and Rooker down until they're actually, they actually play minor league games? I mean, can they really can they really say on April 16th, all right, they've had a few workouts in St. Paul or down in Florida. Like, I agree with right, you. Other yeah. minor leaguers, and now, yeah. now the problem is you know what? out without playing a game in the minors. Yeah, yes, you're probably right, but here's the thing. The Players Association at some point in time agreed to the stupid rule. Like, it's their fault. Put your foot down and say, no, we're not doing... I mean, who came up with, like, April 16th as this mythical... The Cubs just sent a guy down, uh, second baseman, had a great spring. Like, easily one of the best players on that team in the spring. And I know it's hashtag small sample size, but still... And I believe he, he needs to spend 36 days down, and then he can come up and won't get the year of service time. Who agreed to this crap? Like, who said, we'll sign there? Yeah, that sounds like a good deal. Like, make the team have to make a decision that's either going to be punitive completely or screw it, he can start on opening day. Yeah. So I fault the players, too. And if this rule is not taken out in, in the next um, – CBA that's going to be negotiated this winter, then they're idiots because this this is one of the dumbest things in sports possible. Like we're talking about this collection of good young talent. Baseball is the only sport where we're suppressing the excitement. Yeah. One last note on garlic here too. I'm ordinarily very much anti 
reward a great spring training guy because I just think you do more damage to your team by saying, wow, Luke Hughes was great against right. AAA pitching in spring training as guys got <laughs> ramped up. And so let's give him a featured spot in the lineup. Like I would put more stock into their major and minor league track records than I would into like three weeks of spring training at bats. That's why I'm not freaking out over Max Kepler. I think I would be more nervous about Max Kepler having a couple down years uh, in the major leagues than I would be about him having two hits in spring training. But with Garlic, I, I, just to just to you know belabor the point, he was great in the minor league. Now it's the Pacific Coast League in 2019. It's a more offense friendly league, and so you're going to see higher OPSs. A lot of those like there's just a lot of hitter friendly stadiums and whatnot. Um, so I, I do think they're taking into account the last time he played a full season, 2019, he was great offensively, and then he carried that over into spring training. So the other thing from yesterday, and I wasn't on the, the Talking Twins show with you guys and Jake DePew, but apparently Judd Zolgad, you said 96 wins for and this a third, Twins team? And a third consecutive division title. I am assuring no playoff success, so I stop right there. 18 consecutive Defeats, I will I will uh, punt on trying to predict what's going to happen once the Twins get to the playoffs. Hopefully, for their sake, they can finally win a game. But, yes, I said 96 wins, and here's why. One, I think people are, are down on the Twins because of the playoff lack of success. But I think this team could be pretty damn good. And I don't think the starting pitching at the top has been this good for a long time. A long time? So I actually think that there's a case— to be made that the Twins go into the season with a strong club. And, and I mean, this is the absolute key, but I'm predica- I'm predicating the prediction on guys staying healthy. But, Phil, if you've got Simmons at short, Donaldson at third, let's go out on a massive limb and say Buxton plays. And let's say he plays 140 or something like that, okay? I, I know, I know. Blown mind. I'm with you. But... If you look at this team defensively and pitching-wise, they could be pretty damn strong. They've still got pop at, at the plate. I think guys like Garver are going to come back. Uh, if Donaldson can play consistently, he could be very good. I mean, go go back to uh, 2019 when Donaldson played 155 games for the Braves. He had a great year. And my other point on saying 96 wins and a division title for the Twins is based on this. And I've been high on this team for two years. But I think we're now over our skis on White Sox fever, and here's why. Jimenez being hurt is a big deal. Lance Lynn is a big pickup. And the more I think about this, I think to myself, Lance Lynn looks basically like I do, okay? And he pitched for the Rangers last year, who were sort of a dumpster fire And he was really good on a dumpster fire. He's now going to be pitching in Chicago on a team with expectations. That changes things. So I'm not sure that he's going to be as good as the White Sox or the prognosticators expect. And then the last thing, and I feel like we don't talk about this enough. If A.J. Hinch had gotten the White Sox job, I think I might pick them to win the division. But Tony La Russa is an old curmudgeonly man who is taking over one of the funnest teams, I think, in baseball. It's true. Anderson, Abreu. Like, look at this club. Uh, Yeah. Look at that club and look at their talent and look at how their talent is is also a group that likes to bat flip. No problem there. I love that. But, I mean, they are fun. And they're going to be managed by this old curmudgeon who probably is going to sit at the hotel bar on the road and complain about bat flips. I think that there's a lot that can go wrong there, and I do think the one thing, last point, in the regular season that Rocco brings, and I appreciate this, is stability. I could see the Twins, again, being very successful and getting up to 95 or 96 wins, and then come fall, they're on their own. You know, yeah. You know, I'm so I just want to pick a few things and react here. So I, I think they're kind of between 90 and 94. I said 94 yesterday on Twitter, just just for the high end. And for the first time in, I started doing a daily radio show with Patrick Royce before the 2010 season, and I think I've put a record out every single year just to like, just to put something out and to be wrong or right, mostly wrong. This is the first year that I, and, and and then we would predict like playoff like are they going to go to the playoffs win the division like this is the first year where I'm not even going to venture a guess in the postseason. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. I'll, I'll give you. A, I think they can win 94 games. Mm-hmm. 
and then after that, I'm just along for the ride. So, like, I'm yep. not I'm not going to make any – they're going to win a playoff series predictions. A few things on the White Sox. I agree. I think overall the sentiment has been people are just way, way, way too high on that team. There's so many things. Like, they just lost Eloy Jimenez for the season last week. One of their best hitters just out for the season. Uh, I do disagree with you a little on Lance Lynn. Like, Lance Lynn had one bad season, and it was here in Minnesota. So we saw the worst of him. He played and pitched in some of the biggest games with the Cardinals before he came to the Twins. Like, that dude, is, he's been a big game pitch, uh, pitcher before, and he's and he's pitched on really good teams. So I don't, I don't like, I think he's good, and I think he's going to be good for the White Sox. I think reasons for the White Sox being overinflated um, – are more like they got a bunch of young players who aren't all going to ascend at the same time. So I think the Twins are more predictable. Like they've got a bunch of veterans with track records, and you can sort of predict their performance. And if they stay healthy, you can almost guarantee a certain level of performance. The thing that I love about the Twins the most going into this year, if Shoemaker and Hap can stay in that rotation and just be serviceable at the back end of the rotation, your bullpen is really, really good. I mean, the fact that you've got Jorge Alcala, and Randy Dobnak as like multi-inning relievers that one guy throws 98 and the other guy comes in and gets ground balls. You've got so you've got those two firefighters in sort of the you know innings four through seven range. You've got three guys at the back end that could close. So I I, I really I think this is a sneaky good bullpen if they don't have to tap into it because like Matt Shoemaker can't stay healthy, which has been the case. His entire career. So, sure. Dex, Dex, where, where are you at? How how, how far are you going to go with your Twins optimism? Yeah, I, I think I said 92 wins with Judd and Jake yesterday. I'm at 92 wins. I think the White Sox win it by like a game. Um, I actually still think the White Sox lineup is just as good as the Twins without Eloy Jimenez. I think that lineup can absolutely rake. Um, and then my biggest caveat is if that back end of the White Sox rotation takes the next step. So those are guys like Dylan Cease and Michael Kopech who are high-end prospects, and Cease hasn't really panned out. Kopech opted out last year for multiple reasons. If those two dudes hit their ceilings, all of a sudden Dallas Keuchel becomes a four or five, and those two dudes are horses in the in their starting rotation, mm-hmm. it gets scary. Then like the White Sox are not just going to have, oh, they're going to hit a lot of home runs and be a really good lineup. They're going to have a legitimate starting rotation. So I think it really hinges on those two dudes taking them over the top because right now they are, yeah, they're an 85 to 90 win team. I think that's pretty obvious over a course of a normal 162 game season. But if those two dudes take the next step in that rotation, I would be scared if I was the Twins. Yeah. Yeah, they do have, I mean, so I, I believe it's pronounced Kopich, and he's starting off in the bullpen this year. He hasn't really pitched in a game because he, had, I think he had Tommy John, then he opted out. It's been like three years. Yeah. He had some like so, weird personal reasons too for opting out last year. So there was there was some weird things going on in his life. So he, but he like so they'll they'll probably start him in the bullpen, and then maybe he becomes like they probably have to limit his innings. But yeah, Dylan Cease is a guy that could break out. So. You know, we're still waiting for some of these young. Royce wrote about this yesterday in the Star Tribune, just like, all right, it's been five years of Falvey and Levine. Where are the young breakout starting pitchers? Why, why is the scrap heap still being tapped into every winter for the J. A. Haps and you know what, Michael though, Phil, Pinedas, et that that comes back to a confidence within that franchise that they can actually find pitchers off the street and develop bats. It, it was a, it's a very different philosophy. And, and I get it, but it's different than what we expected, right? And this goes to Falvey's confidence that he can actually find arms off the street. Mm-hmm. It, it's why, right or wrong, the poster child for their potential hubris when it comes to pitching, Matt Whistler. They developed him and jettisoned him all in the same thing. They they basically so I don't know that I don't think they're going to develop as much pitching uh, from the organization as we thought. I think they're going to continue to think that they can find guys. And and I will give them this. The Maeda trade right now might be part and parcel of that ability. And right now, that looks really impressive. Yeah. All right, Judd, are you ready? Are you ready for your big Oh, I've been there? ready since Sunday. If you smell what the rock is cooking. All right, we have Judd on. We're going we're gonna to probably do this monthly so we can yeah, we can't do it too much. Yeah, we can't do it too much. But Declan and I are huge, huge wrestling fans. We're we're definitely disappointed by the current WWE product, but like we've been wrestling fans for a long time. Judd has basically never watched wrestling. Like he's never gotten into wrestling. And so every once in a while on the show, 
we have this segment called Judd Explains Wrestling. If you mm-hmm. smell! Where we give Judd a homework assignment. And this week's homework assignment, the last time we did this was the Montreal screw job. Montreal screw job. One of the most famous moments in wrestling history. This is another one of the more famous moments in more recent wrestling history. Judd explains the CM Punk mic drop promo. Pipe drop. Do- Pipe bomb. Pipe bomb. Pipe bomb. Oh, Pipe bomb. Now, do, do you, Phil, want, want to set this up with a brief explanation, and then I will explain the rest as far as what this was? Declan, what do you think? Should we, yeah. should we set it up, or should we just make Judd talk about it and see what happens? Well, t- well, here. I, I do think there should be a little bit of a backstory. Yeah, give give the ba- give the basic backstory, and because I'm going to delve into the inside okay. baseball part of this. Okay. Like, this, go, this goes deep. I'm not going to lie here. So ten years ago, ten years ago, CM Punk, CM Punk was like was a really good tier two star in WWE with potential tier one aspirations, but he just never like he had a bunch of decent storylines, never fully broke through. He wasn't like the company man ass kisser, and so his contract was coming up in like three weeks. And on Monday Night Raw, at the end of one of the episodes, he grabs a microphone, sits down at the top of the ramp. And spends like six, seven, eight minutes shredding the company on live TV. And people couldn't figure out, was this scripted? Was it real? Was it a combination of both? They cut his microphone off because he was about to he was about to tell a Vince McMahon bullying story. And then they cut his microphone off. And then, boom, he gets launched into the stratosphere. And he goes on to become champion for like 400 straight days. Uh, and then it launches a, a short UFC career, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, Judd Zolgad, take it away. June 2011 is when this occurred. All right. First of all, Phil sent me the footage of the the actual pipe bomb, and which I watched. And then I went back and watched a bunch of punk. And CM Punk, first of all, is fantastic, okay? One, he doesn't, like, he he's a cut dude. Don't get me wrong here. But he definitely does not look like he belongs in the world of wrestling as far as the huge steroided out guys. Um, between his look and between his demeanor, he's a smart, thoughtful guy who, who you could tell can be a complete a-hole at times. Mm-hmm. He is basically wrestling's Trevor Bauer. He basically reminds That's me fair. a lot of Bauer. That's actually very fair. Yeah, it's not because he can likeable. be. He's not, but but he he can be if he flips the switch. It's it's very odd, uh, but he's definitely smart. He's smart and he knows he, he's smart. Now, as far as the actual pipe bomb, I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm going to blow your mind. This was not a promo, and it was not a shoot. A shoot being an unscripted. He <laughs> takes the mic and goes off script. This was not either of those things. It was both. And it was genius, okay? McMahon and company knew that they had this bitter, but yet really intelligent and articulate um, guy on staff who was negotiating a contract. And the key thing to keep in mind here about why it was not a promo or a shoot was CM Punk didn't leave W. W.E. until 2014. So his contract was up, but he was, but there, but they were clearly in negotiations that proved fruitful in 2011 to bring him back. So what I think McMahon and his people did was they took the chance that they knew that CM Punk would essentially, for lack of a better term, if he got the mic, roast them, but it would be good. I don't think they knew it would be this good because, like this, it was brilliant. Do you, do you think they cut his mic on? Like, do you think the cutting of his mic was them saying, "Here's what I think that's they, enough," or do you think that was scripted? Here's what I think they told him. I think they said essentially, "You've got X amount of time, and then we're going to cut your mic." He said, "The company will be better when Vince McMahon is dead." Yeah, on right. Live but the, TV. but <laughs> but Mc, but McMahon, but McMahon is he's an incredible, arrogant jerk. But he's smart enough to know Mm -hmm. that CM Punk had the juice. He had the juice to carry that, and he did. Like it, and and it wasn't. It here's the thing about Punk that's different than like The Rock or Cena. Punk isn't a cartoon character. Like he's a great villain, 
but like The Rock's a cartoon character. He's this huge guy, and he's and he's he's great at what he does, but it's like a cartoon. Punk basically appealed to a whole different layer of people because he was this uh, recalcitrant malcontent, and he does a great job. And so I think McMahon knew exactly, or I think McMahon had an idea of what he was going to get. I don't think he cared because I think he knew it was going to be good. That being said, I don't think anybody could have predicted it was going to be as good as it was because Punk is fantastic. And the fact that he goes after the crowd and basically says, you're part of the problem too because you buy all these cups that don't have my picture. And he then goes into the whole thing. And the other thing he does is he does about five things. But I love this. When he looks at the camera and says, I'm breaking the fourth wall. That's a great line. And he also calls The Rock Dwayne. Yep. He doesn't oh, call him Dwayne Johnson. He just calls him Dwayne and says he's an ass kisser. And here's and here's why I think they were they were brilliant and knew what Punk might do and signed off completely. Their star was Phil's guy. And I'm with Phil. I don't get this guy. Cena. Okay? That's, De- that's Declan's guy. It's no, not any of our guys. No, but I mean you oh, I you don't Declan like him. Cena. Not, not, but, not a big scene again. No. Okay. Both of you guys don't like him, and I know why. But what I'm saying is Cena is a is the rock light as far as trying to be. And he's a cartoon character, but he's not a great one. Mm-hmm. And so Punk is a complete curveball from that. Mm-hmm. So the fact that he said and, and plus too, how many wrestlers ever in the history of of, of shoots or promos have sat cross-legged on a stage and delivered a soliloquy like that. It like it's genius. totally, it's totally yeah. genius. Just in terms of like, like just in terms of being in front of a sold out arena crowd, I think, and in front of probably two or three million people on TV to just be that comfortable and flawless delivering the biggest promo of your life is amazing. That's, that is live television. I know. And then to go, that. and then to go after all, Everybody and the fan and when he when he said people that like me are the problem too, and then he lays it out completely. And and the most important thing is, I don't think he's kidding. So like I think McMahon said, okay, bleep it, it's going to be good. We don't care. But this is not this is not scripted. Like he's pissed. Amazing. He was he was mad. Um, yeah, the whole thing, the delivery. The reason why I I also think that it was somewhat. Pre-plan- I think it was pre-planned, but not scripted completely. Is is so he goes, he shows up and surprises them, right? And he slams Cena into the table, and then he goes and takes the mic, and somebody just gives him the mic. So it's not like he went and grabbed it, and they were trying to take the mic o- away. So I do, I do think that they turned him loose, knowing he was disgruntled but the the plan was and it worked out this way that he was going to sign a contract which he did i think that summer so anyway the whole thing as far as the marketing of wwe goes was brilliant wow so declan how would you grade judd's explanation uh, of of the cm punk pipe on there that's a that's an A. That's an A. That's an A explanation. Um, Lots of notes. I, I actually did not see the pipe bomb up until like a year ago. I didn't even know the pipe bomb existed up until like a year ago. Wow. Um, I had <laughs> I I exited wrestling from like two thousand six seven to basically like twenty fourteen. So like I I had this gap where I didn't know what happened with wrestling, and then like after WWE Network came in, I started watching back old stuff between that gap period that I missed. But it was during the pandemic last year where I was like, I'm just going down a rabbit hole. Like, what was the best thing that happened in 2011? I literally Googled best WWE 2011. Of course, the pipe bomb and, and the summer of punk came up. Because there's even more that goes in to CM Punk. I mean, that pipe bomb is the crown jewel. But that rivalry with Cena, his match with him at Money in the Bank, another promo where he's in Boston, I think it was the next week on Raw. So he's in Cena's hometown. And he basically calls out Cena, and that that's another great line. I don't know if you saw that one, Judd, but Cena basically, or a Punk calls Cena, like, you're the Boston Red Sox. You're the underdog that everyone wanted to root for, and then you win a bunch of championships, and you're just as big of a problem that is the New York Yankees. And Cena legitimately <laughs> slaps him 
And I believe the tape, like, that was not like a, oh, I'm going to slap you, like, this is a little work thing. Like, that was a legitimate slap, screw you, CM Punk. Like, the hatred between the two was so real. So, yeah, bravo, Judd. Bravo, okay. man. Judd Zolgad explaining wrestling. I got one question, though. Cena, here's my question. The only problem with the pipe bomb is him, and here's why. When Punk shows up, and it's clearly a surprise, and Cena sees Punk and jumps out of the ring and goes to confront him, he takes a swipe or swing at Punk that, like, doesn't even come close. <laughs> How bad was this guy at that? Like, most yeah, of was... these guys are brilliant. Like, if I look like I'm going to hurt you, it's <laughs> going to look like, and I probably do hurt you some. Cena takes a slap at Punk, and I mean, I swear there's air between yeah, the slap the, and him. A lot of the guys from so help me. like so so one of his, so one of Cena's two finishers is a submission move called the STFU, where he essentially like you're on your stomach and he's like grabbing your face and pulling it back. And a lot of the old like Stone Cold Steve Austin, a lot of these guys from the late '90s will rip him for that move looking so fake. Like he leaves so much air between his hands and the guy's neck and it just like he's he's just, he 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 doesn't in wrestling it's called working stiff when you are when you are known for like laying your punches in and really hitting guys and so the guys like John Bradshaw Lafia would work stiff all the time and they would legitimately hurt their opponents sometimes and John Cena I think has gone out of his way for 20 years to just not hurt his opponent and it looks bad sometimes on TV so anyway yeah I was that was my only problem with the yeah. Pipe so, on, but it was great. Judd Zolgad, I agree. That was an A plus explanation. And we'll pick another topic at some point here next month. And Judd will explain wrestling to us again. That is a wrap on today's Mackie and Judd show. Don't forget daily Vikings conversations on Purple Daily Podcast and also our YouTube channel. We have two YouTube channels. And we're up to 17,500 subscribers between the two of them. So thank you, everyone, for clicking subscribe on Score North MN YouTube and also on Purple Daily YouTube. And to everyone who has downloaded the Score North app during the month of March, over 1,000 new registered users on our app. We appreciate all of you guys. We are your home for daily Minnesota sports entertainment and grieving in most cases. And we'll see you guys <laughs> tomorrow for Write That Down Predictions.